happen. Um, I also need to give you some context about this, uh, this story or this thing I'm going to tell, uh, just because you need to understand like, the reasons we made some decisions. And the first one, this, this, this thing is related to Utrust. It's a sponsor here. But this talk was actually approved before that, so it's not a sponsor talk. It just, it just happened that we became sponsors afterwards. Um, so Utrust is very interesting because um, it came out of an ICO, which meant that we had uh, money before we had like something to really show to um, something working for for users, right? And um, this kind of changes perspective on things. Like you, you usually do things in a way that, and they have the reason for that. And things change when you have like money before you have the thing running. Um, so. This is all built mostly in Elixir. I'm just going to talk about backend here. It's Elixir almost everywhere. And where we cannot have Elixir, we just run with some JavaScript and TypeScript. And this happens because on, on the blockchain world, which is, you trust is related to the blockchain. It's basically, pay, it's PayPal for the blockchain. You can say it like that. Um, most libraries are uh, written in JavaScript. In fact, the best ones, the more mature ones. It, it, and those are the ones we want to use. Uh, so we the ICO when we started like coding like crazy people and the first timeline ap approach and we realized we have not deployed in three months, which is like a rookie mistake, but we did it anyway because yeah, priorities change. But we were fine because usually you just run with a git push or a rook master and everything just works and it's, it's fine. It, it never really is, but it sort of feels like it. And it, it wasn't, but we did like a, a little bit fire, uh, fire dance and and everything went fine that time, but realized that we need to do this the right way, otherwise we are going to mess up very quickly. Um, so we did some math. We were using a rope at the time. We usually do, we want to do things fast. But we realized that we needed to slow down and think this through. And the thing is, we wanted to run Elixir and JavaScript and uh, blockchain nodes. We needed a disk with a big storage to synchronize the blockchain. And we also needed to run some service with services with very sensitive code that's going to touch money. And those things we need to really hide from the network. We won't run them in a private network. And that becomes very expensive in Roku. Like if you went there, it's, it's really expensive to do this right. So we were thinking like, uh, maybe we should just change and go like full throttle into some cloud like AWS or Google Cloud or whatnot. Um, and we opened like a DevOps position. We wanted to hire someone to help us with that. And, and we found like a mentor. And, and this is probably like the best decision we did at, at this point because we didn't know anything on how to do this. Um, and this person really helps like um, moving forward, like just finding the right information in the, in the huge amount of things you can find online. So we ended up deciding we'd go with AWS. And the, the reasons, there were a lot of them. But mostly it was because uh, we can do a lot of things with a small group of people there. And we had credits, so that really helps. Um, so we opened up, opened up like the services uh, thing, and you can just see like this thing. I don't know where you guys are looking at, but you can see that thing. And we were like, yeah, this is not going to work very well for us. There's no idea where to start. So our mentor was like, okay, just, just keep calm. You don't really have to navigate that interface. You can just like declare your interface, your infrastructure in code. Um, and then you can do like version control and pull request and roll back and go forward. And you can really manage like manage it very well. It's it's easier this way. Uh, so we did uh, and Terraform sort of looks like this. I don't know if you have experience with it, but you just declare resources in this language, and their tool will go back, apply those changes through the API. This is for DigitalOcean. This is from a personal project. Like I, I, I put like er arrows there because I wanted to point to the slides, but I can't. So I'm just doing it like this. So on the, like I declare like resource with this SSH key, then I create a droplet and then a volume, and uh, below that I think it's attaching the volume to the droplet. And this is something you can put on GitHub, and anyone can just do code review. And you just uh, Terraform apply on this project and just comes to life, which is very interesting. 
Um, so still, so we know how to build resources, but we don't really know how to run things. And if you start looking at online, there's a lot of stuff there, like it's Kubernetes, and it, there's a lot of talks about this. And Beanstalk, something, I mean, I, I don't know anyone that uses this, but they talk about this a lot, so like Heroku for AWS, seems nice. ECS, um, EC2, like it's a different thing, but some people just run directly on, on machines, I guess. Uh, so it's still very confusing. And, and this is, again, where the, having a mentor really helps like going through this. Uh, so first thing he said, and we believe them, it's just, uh, let's, we are going to run this on Docker because we want to run the same images, the same code uh, for multiple environments, so we are confident about th that thing we are running. And we want to use Elastic ECS. So we didn't go with Kubernetes at the time because it wasn't really integrated into the cloud at AWS. It was still, uh, it was still early, um, uh, those days that we didn't, we didn't feel comfortable like going th with it because we didn't know when it was going to be very uh, integrated and we really needed to leverage the services they have. So ECS, it's a container orchestrator. So it basically takes uh, mach some machines uh, and some services uh, which have like Docker container images and just runs them and auto scales them if you want to. And it just manages, sort of, yes, someone is like, uh, um, Someone in the polling <laughs> is distracting me. Um, but yeah, so it really helps. And it's a little bit low, lower level, I guess, from Kubernetes, but it's still, you can do a lot of work with this. It, it's, it's very easy to work with. Um, yeah, so we just run, it's basically, you can have like clusters, and they are services running in machines, and right? that's it. But you still need to know like how exactly are you going to organize things, right? And for us, we really wanted to separate everything. Like, we really wanted to make sure that the different environments won't conflict with each other. If something is happening in our sandbox, it doesn't affect our production environment. And that's, that's important, I guess, for all of us. Um, yeah, this slide doesn't make sense now. Well, so the way we do this is we have the semester account. It's called uh, Tech Ops. And then everyone has an account there. And we organize people in, in groups. Um, and, and then uh, those groups will have different access permissions to the other environments. So if we have uh, other two environments we have, it's like sandbox and production, and they have roles. And roles give, like, give you permissions. Like if you have a role, you can do this sort of actions. And we have like a read access role and a full access one. Um, and we have uh, other ones. This is just the ones, like for example. Um, and then we, we go to the tech ops and we say, okay, so this, the, the, uh, the team in the devs group can use the read access group, uh, read access role, and um, the admins can use the full access role. On the, uh, in the environments, we specify that this, the, the, this account can access the environments, and inside the account, we specify this. So everyone can do their thing, and we can, from a, a single place, like from, from one account, the DevOps account, we can control everyone's access. So, and everyone, like each developer, only has one account to manage. So it, it kind of makes it easier to to deal with. We don't have to go like, changing between, between accounts to access different environments. So this is nice, I think. Um, uh, so we have accounts, we have the tech ops and the different environments, um, and we were thinking, okay, so we don't want to be replicating code a lot, right? We don't want to be copy-pasting like every tech of form configuration between environments. So usually you abstract things, and, and this is uh, something that I extracted from uh, our code base. It's an abstraction. Basically, it creates um, a cluster for us. We just give it uh, a name, an instance type, basically the size of the machines, um, some configuration for auto scaling, and we just copy paste this into the environments, and it just gives us uh, our basic cluster. There, there's more properties that we can put here. It's just the basics, the basic things, things are like this. Um, so we Dockerize everything, and this is our production Docker file. Basically, it's Elixir. There's a couple of things missing, but the, um, yeah, it, it, it's it. So you just build an image. Just don't focus too much on this. It's not important. I'm kidding. So after you have like a Docker image, you can, you can, a Docker file, you can build the image and you can push it to a registry. Um, and the registry you can also create on, on Terraform as well. It's, yeah, no, you can, you can create everything from here. So the two resources, like the first one to create a, reg, a repository and then the policy. 
And the thing is, we, if we create the repositories in the TechOps account, and we then keep the other accounts to fetch images from, from the main one, so we can centralize like the images. This is very fun. So we don't have to push like to every environment. Okay, now you have the, the images and the repository, and you need to deploy things. So you want to create this thing that's called a task definition. And it, it looks like this. It's, it's a JSON file where you can specify images that run together in a sort of a service. In this one, we only have one, and this variable is going to be replaced. Um, at some point, we specify the environment variables and the ports and the memory reservation if you want to, then have to. A couple of things. And then you want to register this and deploy it, which you can do with this ver simplified version of the command that uses the CLI tool to register the task definition and then update the service that's already running um, uh, with uh, this file, with the revision of this uh, task definition. Basically, so this is deploys the, the thing, and then you're done. We don't, yeah. Well, it's a, sorry, uh, so I, I maybe I have to request. Okay, I, I can answer um, in the end, but the question was, why don't we manage deploys with Yahoo Farm? Okay, so, but we, we do all of this, we don't do it manually, as you may guess, we do it on the CI. So just, we have a pipeline that just builds everything and pushes and then register the task definition, deploys, so it's just very easy to work with. We use Circle CI, by the way, it doesn't really matter, you can just do it with anything. So, so we know how to deploy stuff, which is nice. Um, and we have a sort of interesting stuff we need to deploy, which are our blockchain nodes. Blockchain nodes. And, and these things are very interesting because wh when the blockchain is syncing, it sort of needs more memory. Because it doesn't need to, but if you give it, it's going to sync faster, which is very, very important for us. And it also needs like a persistent, like a disk. And our machines, we want to discard them when we need to basically have new ones. We don't want to keep attached to them. We want to destroy them when we need to. So the system is not supposed to be permanent. So we need to attach something else to, and have the, the, the Docker containers right to it. Okay, so we usually, right, we started with uh, having like two clusters, that for, one for the test nets, one from the main nets. Uh, this is an example, this is like, like this as a cluster with one machine and it's running everything in there. And it, all of these are Docker containers. Um, and we noticed that we were putting so much stress in the test net that we needed to build um, another one so our users from the sandbox, like from the live environments, don't get affected. But still, we were having a lot of problems with Bitcoin because it was, it was very, being very um, complicated. So yeah, it was using all the memory. And usually when this happens, when a, a, a container uses a lot of memory, the orchestrator will kill it and just uh, bring up another one. But in this, for this case, happens that um, the image, the, the Bitcoin node was able to make the machine re irresponsive. So you won't be able to connect SSH into it. Like it was just basically dead. We had to destroy it uh, to have a new one, and have a new one. Okay, so we were thinking, yeah. So this is nice. You usually solve this with just throw another, another machine in it. But in our case, because we have like the volumes attached, we cannot just throw another machine because the volume can only be attached to one machine. But, I mean, you can have two machines and attach one to each, but you have to do a placement strategy when you say, okay, Bitcoin only runs the machine two and the other one's on the machine one. And that just sounds confusing, so we just destroy this and just have like a different cluster for everything and everything has, runs in their own machine in a different cluster. So no one gets affected if Bitcoin doesn't really work for us. But it, it was still mis misbehaving. It was still consuming a lot of memory. Uh, so we decided, okay, so we were running like this general portable machine, uh, I think with 16 gigabytes of RAM, and we said, okay, just, just going to improve this to a machine with 64 gigabytes of RAM. There's no way it is not going to work. It's a memory optimized machine, something very special. Um, well, it sort of worked, but it really, it didn't, uh, and we realized that when we had to destroy the machine, the node was sinking from scratch again. Eventually, um, we realized that the, the, the volume was not being attached, which is very strange. And a couple long, long hours later, we realized that because we changed the type of the machine, then the nodes were not being attached because 
uh, on these memory optimized machines, they are sim link instead of mounted. So yeah, they are Nit uh, nitro based uh, stuff. Yeah. So on our user data, we do this uh, this line. You can see it there. So we have to. Yeah. So this was the fix for two hours of work. Just a minus L. You can see it there. Yes, yeah, I, I can see your face. Like this is not possible. It is. Just trust me. This is what happens when you don't know the first thing about uh, this sort of stuff. Uh, just a fun story. Yeah. So the thing is, it, it still didn't work. So while it was singing, it was like we went from having two clusters to having like nine, and big machines and all this, and it still wasn't working. Bitcoin was still just being very hard to deal with. So we were thinking like. Maybe there's sort of a memory leak or something, and maybe it, or maybe this happens because we are doing requests, like a lot of requests, while it is syncing. Uh, so we just stopped our application from doing requests while the, the node was syncing, and it just went fine with four gigabytes of RAM. Yeah. So just a, sorry, no. Just I need to make a pause. Can you guys see this? Yes. Yeah, I'm relaxed now. Um, OK. So more interesting stuff. So this is uh, blockchain. You, want to add, you have like private keys. Like you control your money, right? Or we control your money, I don't know. But so someone controls the money, and that control is done through the private keys. So on the blockchain, I, I don't know you probably know this or not, but usually you are dealing with asymmetric keys, either like public and the private key, and you can spread the public and usually use it to derive your addresses, receive money, and the private key is what you use to sign the transactions. So it, it basically, it's, it's very simple, and every time you need an address, you usually have, you need like a different private key, a different public key to have a different address. But this is really hard to deal with because if you want to have like 100 addresses, you need to back up 100 keys. So people just use HD wallets, which give you like a, a tree-like structure on, uh, of keys. So you have like a master key, and from that one you can derive infinite numbers, basically, um, of other keys. And if you use this thing, it's a ledger. It's like a thing that you can use to keep store your money. Uh, when you when you initialize it, it gives you like a 12 words, I think, or 16. And if you save those words, you can back up the whole wallet, and you can have like an infinite uh, number of addresses. And the interesting thing about this is that you can do um, independent derivation, which is you can derive the public key and the, the private key independently, and you can still generate like working key pairs, uh, sort of like this. So this is a key, it's a private and a public part, and you can separate them, like just completely separate them, and apply the same derivation in them, and those child will work as a key pair, which means that you can take the public part to the web server, and the private part to a more secure environment, and, and you, you can be confident that the private key never has to leave uh, the private environment to generate addresses on demand whenever you need them. Uh, and, and this is actually what we did for the first version of our uh, store, which is we used the actual real ledger, so we generated um, a key, we initialized the ledger, we extracted the public key, gave it to our web server to have uh, addresses on demand, and when we were done, we just take the ledger and write the script, sign transactions, and send it to the blockchain. And this was, was really easy to do. Still, we needed to take this online. And on AWS, you have this, this uh, service. It's called a KMS. It's a key management service. It's very nice. And you can, you can write some policies with S3, which is uh, buckets. You can just save files in there. And you can do this thing, which is you can tell S3 to you can tell AWS to basically when you upload something, encrypt it with the private key, with this key on KMS, and when you fetch it, download it. But you can write very specific policies to define who can encrypt or decrypt things uh, and upload and, and download as well. So this is an example for the, the bucket. In this one, it is an abstraction. You can see, but we, we say like so, whoever has the role downloader can download things, and everything that's uploaded needs to be encrypted with KMS, yeah. Very simple, it's not the whole, the whole policy, 
just a thing I extracted to, to make this point. Someone is making like strange faces on the front in red. <laughs> okay, so, um, and, and for the key as well, we can just say whoever has this role can decrypt things. And this, this way, it's actually transparent. You just upload and, up and download from S3 and everything just works out of the box. It's very fun, sort of out of the box. You have to specify the keys you want to use, but it's very easy to work with. So a simplified vision of our system can sort of be like this, where you have like a public network and a private network, and we have a web server in one place that can generate addresses on demand, and we have like a private place that we can just ask to sign transactions. And that thing is running with um, a role that gives them access to download and sign things. And, uh, and with, uh, uh, with ACS, you can, you can assign roles to services, which means everything is integrated. So it's very easy to do. Just put uh, a key there on the task definition and it just has that permission. Um, also increases the risk on the CI, by the way, just so you have to be mindful of that. Um, yeah, so this is it. I think this is very interesting. Uh, so um, other things, I don't know how much time I have. Oh, I'm going really fast. Jesus. I'm sorry. Well, hopefully not a lot of them. Well, so another thing that's very important is you have to monitor like what's happening, right? So we usually forget this and we just do it in the end and that's uh, the worst thing we did. Yeah, to be honest. And in AWS, we have this sort of like fancy dashboards. Um, they don't look very nice, and they sort of work if you know how to navigate them. That it's, it's, it's OK. But because we have so many environments, it's just very strange to go between them to, to check on things. And if you want to have like alerts, I mean, you can do some stuff, but we were doing like Lambda functions, but they get really complicated if you want to control things. Like if you want to, Notify like every 30 minutes, you need to know that you already did like notify and so it needs state as well. So it just gets confusing and hard to deal with. A and the logs are also not very uh, great. Um, so we use that a lot. Yeah, this is, this is, that's the point. It's, it's not that, that expensive. I, I mean, well, I'm very surprised because we are negotiating prices and I if you do like a pre reservation of things, it gets very cheap, I, I think. I mean, not that cheap, but still. Can you, how can I share my, can you guys see my screen? I may, I have extended. I want to mirror. Okay, mirror. Okay. Well, yeah, so it's like this is, uh, can you see this, right? Yes. So this is um, a, a simple dashboard we just, we just built because we are running like an instance that we built just for for the event, and we have this thing like it's it's a dashboard we built like manually to monitor it. And the way you do this is just go to integrations, connect the AWS account you want to monitor. We connected the Circle CI thing so we can see where when there are deploys happening, and there's we haven't deployed since two days ago, which is very good. I think. No major. Yes, I think it's maybe this is because there's no major concern for us to solve. So, but only for the pixels environment, by the way. And there's the logs here. You have like, you can, the logs are not like this. This is just like a simplified version for us to quickly see if there's something broken. Sentry is here as well. And then we have like some metrics um, and some monitors. So these things here are just looking for very specific metrics and alerting as if something happens. And we have tons of these. Like We have uh, monitors like these to look into the blockchains. They will make regular requests to the blockchain. And if the, um, the block number is not increasing, it will alert us, listen, it's been half an hour and the block number is still the same, something's wrong. So you have to look into this. Uh, and doing this, um, that log is very straightforward. Um, yes, and then, we have, I, I think I can finish like this. Then we also use Sentry. I'm not going to show it. Sentry is great, just use it. It really helps. Um, uh, but, I mean, it, it, it's up to you, but we have used, been using it for, for years now and it's just really good to deal with. And, Jesus, I finished in half an hour. Sorry, guys, 
and thank you. <laughs> So, do you want to make questions? No? Not even that person that was distracting me during the talk. Like, just... Okay, then, um, yeah, I think you got half an hour um, free. Cheers.